pray then. Oh, dear Lord and Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, how good it is to be here, Lord, to be fellowshipping together with you, Lord, and to share in the depth, the beauty, and the perfection of your word, Lord. And as we study your word now, Lord, I would just ask, Lord, that you would guide our thoughts, Lord, so that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts, Lord, might always be acceptable in your sight, Lord, and guided only by your Holy Spirit. We ask this in our Saviour's name. Amen. Well, from, from time to time, we've talked about God's appointed times, the appointed times of Leviticus 23, then, the ones running through, of course, from Passover, then, number seven of them, through to uh, Tabernacles at the end. And, of course, they, they continue to be important to us because we know that God unfolds his purposes according to these appointed times. But there are two other appointed times then that relate to miracles that occurred late in Old Testament times, in Old Covenant times. Um, first of all, Hanukkah, which is in December, and that relates to the time when the Jews rededicated the temple after it had been defiled by that Antiochus uh, III, then, and that Antichrist figure. And uh, that is important to us because it was on the Feast of Dedication, when they rededicated the temple then, that Jesus went into the temple. That was when he declared, I and the Father are one. He defined the Trinity then on that time of dedication. And then there's one other uh, appointed time then, that's the appointed time of Purim. Appropriate for us to look at now, because we're coming up to it in a few days then. And the appointed time of Purim actually concerns only the Jewish people. Nevertheless, it's got an awful lot to teach us then. It occurs right at the end of the religious year then. So in a way, we find uh, Passover then at the beginning and Purim at the end, then really defining God's deliverance then of the beginning and the end, God's deliverance then of the Jewish people then. It's sort of emblematic of that really. And the book of Esther then, which is what records this, uh, uh, tells us about Purim, and you'll find that then just before the book of Job, it records the third time that an exiled Jewish man rose to excellent status then, supreme status in a Gentile government then. The first of them, of course, was Joseph in Egypt, and then we have Daniel in the Babylonian Empire, and then we have Mordecai then in the Persian Empire, then in this book of Esther. And we shall see that Mordecai becomes a type of the Messiah. Now, reformers such as Martin Luther had a problem with the book of Esther. They had a problem because the name of God is never openly mentioned, although, as we shall see, the Holy Spirit is definitively the author of this book then. The actual hidden nature of God in this book is deliberate. You see, the period of God's silence is symbolic of the apparent absence of his presence during the time of the Gentiles then, over those 19 centuries then, where the, uh, during the involving the dispersion of the Jewish people around the world then, and ultimately leading, of course, to the reestablishment of the nation in 1948. This is actually the last of three periods that we know as periods of God's absence. The first of them was the 400 years of their sojourn in Egypt then, and ultimately their enslavement before Moses came and delivered them then. The uh, second one then is the time period between that last prophet of the Old Covenant times of Malachi then, through to the incarnation of our Lord. And that is also another period of 400 years. And the third, of course, is the period embraced by the new covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ, what we know then as the time of the Gentiles. Yet, throughout this time, God has assured his people, his people Israel, that he's always with them. He's always looking over them. Take, for example, Genesis 28, 16, then. Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done all that I have spoken through you. And another example is Joshua, chapter 1, verse 5. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you, and I will not leave you nor forsake you. And then, of course, we have that epistle to the Jewish people, specifically in the New, in the new Covenant times, the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews, 13, 5. He himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you then. 
So if we go into the book of Esther then, in the first chapter, we read, then it was in the third year of the reign of Azurius, who reigned over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. And he sat on the throne of his kingdom in Shushan. Now, Azurius' name in Greek is translated Erxus the first then. That's what you will often read it of in, in the history book. And he ruled actually between 486 and 465 BC. And that was more than 40 years after a rump of the people had already returned back to Jerusalem then to rebuild the, rebuild the temple. Well, this man Azurius, then, he was consumed with pride in ruling over this enormous empire, larger than any other before. And we read in chapter 1 that he made a feast for all his officials, nobles and princes, to show off the riches of his kingdom and the splendor of his majesty. He did this for 180 days. Now, God hates pride, pride then, especially when he raises people up then to esteem positions then. And just like Pharaoh and Nebuchadnezzar, we will find then that God had to humble this man then. Well, not content with this show, the king ordered another feast for seven days for the whole court. And he ordered his queen Vashti then to be present. As she refused, and you don't refuse the order of an emperor. And this created a crisis which required the seven wise men. This is where we learn about them, these magi, these wise men that actually ruled over all the Persian Empire. We first, of course, meet them in Nebuchadnezzar's time because Daniel became the man who overruled these magi then. Much later, we see them, of course, coming in to Bethlehem then to, to see the incarnation of our Lord then. So we see these wise men then coming and ruling. They're telling what should be done. Their decision is in verse 19. It is, let the king give her royal position to another better one. With a decree sent through letters to all the king's provinces then in the diverse languages and the many people across this diverse empire. Now, in chapter 2, then the king's servants are now seeking out then the most beautiful virgins in the empire. And it's this point that we are introduced to Mordecai the Jew. He's a Jew then from the tribe of Benjamin. Now, the authorship of the book of Esther is generally attributed to this man then. Uh, that's confirmed by Josephus, the historian then, and also the, the early church fathers attributed the authorship then to Mordecai. Well, we learn that he'd adopted Esther, his uncle's orphan daughter then, and her Hebrew name is Hadasha, which means myrtle tree. The myrtle then, one of those seven religious trees that we've explored quite recently then, an evergreen producing fragrant white star flowers. In contrast, her Persian name Esther means star and probably derives from the Babylonian god Ishtar. Well, Esther was taken then with the rest of the maidens and she was found especially pleasing to the point that she was allocated a place in the king's palace. Mordecai had specifically told her not to reveal her Jewish identity. And so before going before the king, the girls were allowed any kind of beautification that they wanted. But as we read in verse 15, Esther chose to go with no adornment, but she nevertheless found favor with the king. In verse 17, the king loved Esther more than all the other women and set the royal crown upon her head, making her queen. And he ordained a great feast the Feast of Esther, for all his officials and servants. He proclaimed a holiday in the province of giving of gifts according to his generosity. Well, the end of chapter 2 contains a short but very important note. As the, Austrian, as the Austro-Hungarian Empire found back in 1914, if you try and rule over masses of different ethnic peoples, then you're going to be subject to the threat of assassination. And indeed, Asurius himself was eventually assassinated. But here, we read that Mordecai uh, was able to report and to stop an attempted assassination of the king then. This confirmed his loyalty, and it was recorded in the Chronicles of the Kings of Persia. Well, in chapter 3, we move forward nine years then to the twelfth year of Asurius' reign. Esther is now a favoured queen, and her Jewish identity is still secret. 
A lot had happened in those nine years. Consumed with delusions of power, aiming to expand his empire yet more, Azurius invaded Greece. With an army of hundreds of thousands of men, he built a pontoon bridge over the Dardanelles then and sent them all over into Greece. And they were held up by those 300 Spartans at the Pass of Thermopylae. But they, after they got over that then, they went on to devastate Athens and the, and the area around there. But then their fleet was destroyed by the Greeks then in the naval battle of Salamis. And then fearful that he would be cut off, Azorius fled back to Persia then. And he, he left behind an army, but that was eventually defeated by the Greeks then. So this left Azurius then a humble man, and we now find him cooperating with a very nasty individual, who was, however, both influential and rich. You see, this is where we are introduced to Haman the Agagite. Agag was a king of the Amalekites, a tribe of people descended from a grandson of Esau. Satan had selected these people to instill them with an implacable hatred of the descendants of the people of Israel. In Numbers 13, their home is linked to the area of the Negev, an area that broadly also includes the territories of Edom. Um, Edom is also a descendant of Esau, and Esau and he also contended, of course, very much with the people of Israel then. Well, in spiritual times, the Amalekites then are the antecedents of that eternal hatred of the Jewish people, which continues to today. And in Deuteronomy, the, uh, the Israelites were told to blot out the Amalekites when they entered the Promised Land. Well, their first king, Saul, he failed to do this then. And as a result of that, he lost God's blessing then. And David had to continually contend with them. Although they then seemed to let it disappear from history. Of course, there were people like this man, Haman then, who, who were scattered through the empires then, some of them becoming very rich and very wealthy. And the eternal hatred that these Amalekites then present persist to this day. A Holocaust memorial in The Hague reads, remember what, uh, what Amalek has done to you, and do not forget. Well, likely in reflection of his weakened position, King Azurus elevates this influential man, Haman, to gather his princes and ex he expects everyone to pay Haman homage. Mordecai, evidently sensing the spirit behind this man, refuses to bow down to him, at the same time declaring that he did this because he was a Jew. Of verse 5, Haman was filled with wrath, and he sought to destroy not just Mordecai, but all the Jews throughout the whole empire. So that in the first month of Nisan, then, they cast poor. This means like uh, it's a, with a, they throw a dice, really, and find the an optimum time, then, before Haman, then, to determine the day of the destruction of the Jewish people. And it came out as Adar, then, which is the last month of the Hebrew year. So here we are at the first month, then, to, when he's doing this uh, superstitious ritual, then, and then right at the end, then, in the last month of Adar, then, that's when he's, he's been told that he's got to destroy the Jewish people. Well, Haman reminds the king that these are a people who set themselves apart, and he requests the authority to exterminate them, for which he offers the king a large sum of money. No doubt to help his depleted coffers, the king's scribes were called to write a decree, sealed with the king's signet ring on the 13th of Nisan with all that Haman commanded in the language of all the peoples of every province throughout the empire. Well, these letters were sent then into all the king's provinces then to, to destroy and annihilate all the Jews, young and old, little children and women, on that one day, the 13th day of Adar, and to plunder their possessions. Well, here, of course, we see a foreboding of what happened in the Nazi Holocaust then. We read, so the king and Haman, they sat down to drink together, but the city of Shushan was perplexed. Chapter 4. Chapter 4, then, when Mordecai learned what had happened, he tore his clothes, because that's the Jewish signature of Greece, isn't it? We, we heard it then in the context of Job, in the context of David then, and remember God tore the veil of the temple then too for his grief over the death of his son on the cross then. And he put on sackcloth and ashes. 
he cried out with a loud and bitter cry at the front of the king's gate. In every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning amongst the Jews, with fasting, weeping and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Well, at this traumatic point in the story, we've got a place in the Hebrew scripture telling us that God is indeed behind all that is happening. Counting every seventh letter then, through this verse then, uh, we were, <laughs> where Mordecai is crying and reading, then it reads then, God Almighty El Shaddai, you see. So El Shaddai means God Almighty, he who overpowers. So we see there then, cryptically in this scripture here then, that God is going to take command over this situation. Well, Esther's maid told her, and she was deeply distressed. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai and take his sackcloth away, but he would not accept them. Esther was clearly insulated from all that was going on, and it is only through the eunuch, um, Hathak, um, going out to see Mordoc, uh, Mordecai, rather, that she would learn of the plight of her Jewish people. Mordecai wants the plight of her people brought to the attention of the king, but he's reminded then that only in the peril of death could anyone enter, could Esther even enter into the king's presence without being called. But then Mordecai warns Esther, he says, do you think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews? For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. He is a man of faith, you see. He knows that God is going to deliver them, even if it would not be through, through Esther, you see. But if that is the case, you and your father's house will also perish. But then he set the challenge to Esther. Who knows whether you have come into the kingdom for a time such as this. So Esther is stirred into action. This is where those biblical three days again come into play. Think of the three days then between Abraham and Isaac going up to Moriah. Then think of the three days before they cross over the Jordan. Think of the three days when our Lord was in the tomb then these three days. So verse 16, go gather all the Jews and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, nights or days. My maid and I will fast and then I will go to the king which is against the law. But if I perish, I perish perish. Chapter 5, the third day then. God oversees this. We've got another place then in the Hebrew scripture here where we're told that God is directly behind this then. In every second letter in the Hebrew of this first verse of chapter 5 reads then security and rapture then. We, in every letter at a different spacing then because Yeshua, yes, the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ is here then influencing the king. And lo and behold, when Esther goes into the king, Esther is accepted with the most gracious favor. What do you wish, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given to you up to half the kingdom. Well, Queen Esther had a cunning effect on the king then because we find him repeating this offer three times. Tactfully, because of his close association with the king, she doesn't seek to condemn Haman directly. Instead, she arranges a banquet to which both the king and Haman are invited to be present. This is another place in the Hebrew text where the signature of God then is seen in the text. Every letter through this verse then, where, where Esther is declaring this banquet then, reads Yahweh, the Aleph and the Tav. The Aleph and the Tau, the Alpha and the Omega then, like we read in Revelation, of course. So God is behind all this. God is organizing this, you see. There. Well, Haman, he went out joyfully, but when he saw Mordecai at the king's gate, did not tremble before him, he was filled with indignation. Haman should have been bowing down, um, Mordecai rather, should have been bowing down, you see, before Haman. Restraining himself, he called his friends and wife Suresh, telling them how the king had promoted him above all the officials and servants, and that Queen Esther had invited just him and the king to her banquet. Yet beneath his pleasure in all this he seems to have achieved lies his seething hatred of the Jewish people. 
Yet he says, oh, this avails me nothing so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting there at the king's gate. And then his wife, Zeresh, and his friends said, make a gallows. And in the morning, suggest to the king that Mordecai be hanged on it. And then go merrily with the king to the banquet. Well, this pleased Haman, and he had the gallows made. Now, you know, in the Hebrew gematria, Latin Greek too, where every letter has also got a numeric value as well. And if you add up the numeric values of Haman's name, you get multitudes of 13, Satan's number. And Seresh, she is equally committed in his, in his crimes. And if you add her name up in the Hebrew, you also get multiples of 13. You see, so these two are indeed agents of Satan. Chapter 6. Now we see God moving before disaster can overtake Mordecai. The king cannot sleep, and he calls for the chronicles of the kings of Persia to be read before him. And here he is reminded that Mordecai once saved him from being assassinated. He asks what has been done to honor Mordecai, and when he learns that nothing has, he calls in Haman. Now Haman's always there on hand now to do the king's bidding. So Haman came in, this is verse 6 then, and the king asked him, what shall be done for a man whom the king delights to honor? Now, it's interesting here, isn't it, that we see how God wrong, wrong foots the pride of his enemies. There, how, how, now Haman thought in, in his heart, he thought, whom would the king delight to honor more than me? Then Haman answered the king, for the man whom the king delights to honor, let a royal robe be bought, which the king has worn, and a horse on which the king has ridden with a royal crest placed on its head. Then let this robe and the horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes, that he may array that man whom the king delights to honor. And then parade him on horseback through the city square and proclaim, thus should be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Well, Haman, of course, thought it's all this was going to happen to him, didn't he? But then, Haman doesn't get the answer he expected. Verse 10, So the king said to Haman, Harry, take the robe and the horse, as you suggested, and do so for Mordecai the Jew, who sits within the king's gate. Leave nothing undone of all that I have spoken then. So Haman took the robe and the horse, arrayed Mordecai, and led him on horseback then through the city square, swallowing his pride then, and proclaimed before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Afterwards, Mordecai went back to the king's gate, but, but Haman, in his shame, he hurried to his house, mourning with his head covered, and he told his wife Zeresh all that had happened to him. And Zeresh and his friends said, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of Jewish descent, you will not prevail and surely fall before him. You see, even these evil people, you see, knew in their hearts that there is something special about these people. God is looking after them then, and however small in number, they've always been allowed to survive and to, and to prosper. So that brings us to chapter 7 then. Chapter 7. In the second day of the banquet, when her two guests had had their fill of wine and the king's delight in his queen causes him to make another offer, she then reveals her Jewish identity. Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and it pleases you, let my life be given for my people at my request. For my people and I have been sold to be destroyed, killed and annihilated. Had we just been sold as slaves, I, I would have held my tongue, although the enemy would never compensate for the king's loss. So King Azorius, he answered Queen Esther, he said, Who is he and where is he? who would dare presume in his heart to do such a thing. And Esther said, the adversary and the enemy is this wicked Haman. So Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. The king arose in his wrath and went out into the palace garden, whilst Haman pleaded for his life before Queen Esther. The king ret returned to see a groveling Haman, and seeing the true nature of this man, he condemned him. Then Habana, the eunuch, said, look, the gallows, fifty cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on the king's behalf, is standing there at the house of Haman. And the king said, hang him on it. 
So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. And then the king's wrath subsided. Still two, two more chapters though. Chapter 8. Esther was given authority over the house of Haman. And she now tells the king that Mordecai is related to her. The king takes the signet ring of authority that he has given to Haman. And he gave it to Mordecai, whom Esther is now able to appoint over the house of Haman. But her work is not yet finished. She asked the, queen, the king to revoke the letters devised by Haman, giving him authority to annihilate the Jews then throughout the empire. This is where we run into a problem, you see, because a, a, a decree that's been issued by the Persian Empire then cannot simply be nullified then. It's not like um, the Babylonian Empire where Nebuchadnezzar could simply have cancelled the order of a previous decree then. And here we can look into Daniel's vision of the four empires because he looks at the status of these empires. Remember, Babylonian Empire then, that's the empire of gold, then Persia though is silver, then Greece is bronze, and of course the Roman Empire is iron. And then also then in chapter 7 of Daniel, we've, got the, uh, we've also got the status there. Nebuchadnezzar is the lion, Persia is the bear, then Greek is the leopard, and Rome is that terrible beast then. Well, Persia then is the silver and the bear. You see, the, the supreme leader has not got the same authority as he had, as Nebuchadnezzar had over his Babylonian empire. In fact, this king is ruled by the magi, by the wise men then. They tell, they have to tell him what to do then. So the king's scribes were called then, this is verse 9, in the third month. So this is Sivan on the 23rd day. They dictated by Mordecai to all the authorities in the provinces from India to Ethiopia and sealed with the king's signet ring. This decree permitted the Jews to annihilate anyone who assaulted them and plunder their possessions then on the 13th day of the 12th month, you see. So if people using the first decree, when we were going to attack them then, they could use this decree then to do in reverse what those people were going to do to them. So verse 15 then, Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal apparel, a blue and white, the colors of the Israel flag, of course. He was wearing a great crown of gold and a royal robe of purple, as the city of Shushan rejoiced and was glad. In every place where the king's decree came, the Jews had great joy. Then many of the people in the land became Jews because a fear of the Jews fell upon them. This last sentence is a little bit ominous, really, you see, because it tells us, you know, that all the people we know as Jews are not directly then from the, from the family line of, uh, of Abraham and Isaac. And I think a true Jew is a person with a desire of next year in Jerusalem. That defines the Jew, the true Jew, next year in Jerusalem. They've got their assignment to go back then to their own country. There are lots of people who claim to be Jews then, but are not Jews. And I could give you examples of people then amongst the elite of the world, for example. They include people such as George Soros and Henry Kissinger. Well, there are people, of course, who have no love of Israel. Well, finally, in chapter 8, then it was on the 13th day of the 12th month of Adar that the king's original decree was preparing the enemies for the Jews to overpower them. But now, this new decree allowed the Jews, supported by the authorities, to destroy those who sought their harm, because the fear of Mordecai had fallen upon them, and his flame had spread throughout all the provinces. See, Mordecai, you see, he becomes a type of the Messiah, a type of Christ. Well, he learned then in verse 30 that these letters then are sent out to all the provinces then with words of peace and truth. That's another verse then where we can read equidistant letter spacing then and we can read God is the Aleph and the Tav then. He's behind all this, you see there. Well, we learn that the Jews were allowed to destroy their enemies in Shushan. The ten sons of Haman were taken and the king asked and Esther what to do with them. And she says, verse 13, let Haman's ten sons be gathered on the gallows. 
Well, the Jews then were allowed to destroy their enemies, but neither, neither in Shushan nor in the provinces did they plunder their pro properties. And here, really, we see them following the instruction of Joshua with the people entering the Promised Land. You see, they were not to be corrupted by the material possessions, then, of the people that they overcame of their enemies. It would be God who would provide for their material needs. So the 14th and the 15th day of the month of Adar, then they rested, they made them, that's what we're coming up to, it'll be the Feast of Purim shortly then, made it a day of feasting and gladness. This was to become the Feast of Purim, celebrated ever since the day on which the Jews had rest from their enemies. Now, I'd like you just to pay attention to the dates recorded in this, Nazar in this narrative. It was on the 13th day of the first month of Nisan that these Pur were cast then, giving the later date of the 13th of the last month to carry out the destruction of the Jews. And when Esther found out, she called that three-day fast. That would be the 14th, 15th, and 16th day of Nisan. The same day, the same day as the religious year, as our Lord was in the tomb then. And then Esther's banquet began on the 17th, when Haman is condemned, Mordecai is honored on the Feast of First Fruits, you see. Haman, the type of the Antichrist, was destroyed on the very day of the religious year that our Lord rose from the dead and defeated Satan. Beautiful correlation there, wonderful. But, but there's even more. Mordecai's degree to the Jews was written on the 23rd day of the third month, Sivan before being sent out to all the provinces, reading Peace and Truth. This declaration of freedom for the Jews throughout this vast empire was on the day of Shavuot. The day then, of course, way back when the Jewish people received the uh, law then on Mount Sinai. But it's also Pentecost then, the very day of the religious year then, when the Jews were given the Torah on Mount Sinai and the whole world was later offered the gift of the Holy Spirit by God at the same day, way back here then, as the Jews were given peace and truth then by the declaration, this decree then, that came from Mordecai. So you see, everything fits in then with the, with the biblical narrative as a, as a whole then. Now, go forward now, all the way to 1946, when uh, uh, most, of the, most of the Nazis then, most of the perpetrators of the Nazi crimes had now either slipped back into the woodwork or they used the Vatican rat lines then to escape, or they'd use Operation Paperclip to get over to America. But it was important to have a show trial at Nuremberg with the 10, 11 rather, 11 most prominent Nazis responsible for the Jewish Holocaust. Well, they were tried. They were tried by a military tribunal. Normally, the judgment from a military tribunal then is shooting them, is a death by shooting them. But for some reason, they said, let in accordance with Esther's uh, instruction that Haman's ten be hanged, everything was changed. These ten, ten of these Nazi criminals then were hung instead. And in the book of Esther, four of the Hebrew letters in Haman's son's names use small instead of big characters. And when you use then the gematria to add them up then, they come out to the Jewish year 5707 which is also our calendar year, 1946 then. So the, these 10 Nazi war criminals then were hung, just like Haman's sons were hung then, but one escaped, he was, he was Hermann Goring, he committed suicide, and we're told in the Jewish Talmud that Haman had a daughter, and she escaped by committing suicide. Now one of the 10 uh, condemned people there Oh, there's a man called Julius Stryker. He was the editor of a very nasty anti-Semitic Der Sturmer paper. And realizing the significance of what was unfolding, he cried out, Purman, uh, Purim Festival, 1946, just as he was being hung. You see, he saw through the significance of what was going on. Now go forward, another seven years then, before, just before Purim, in 1953. Stalin 
that tyrannical dictator then who led the USSR through 30 years of terrible oppression and misery, he was now finalising plans to deal with the nation's three million Jews. The Jews were aware of his intentions then, and they could see all the, all the trains being prepared then. They were going to be shipped out to camps as far away into, Nigeria, into Siberia then, and left there to die of cold starvation, starvation then. In the pattern of the Holocaust then, these trains all over Russia were being requisitioned to carry the Jews into exile and a slow death. The expulsion was due to begin on the 6th of March. But just a few days after Purim then, Stalin would justify his crime by falsely accusing six Jewish doctors of trying to poison his leadership. And when this was questioned, he flew into a rage and he collapsed into a coma and he died a few days later. And on the day of Purim, thousands of Jews then in Russia were set free to rejoice in God's deliverance. And, um, hmm. Well, there are several lessons then, five lessons I think, to be learnt from the Book of Esther then. First of all, a book that secular historians like to dismiss as a myth is definitely God's divine word. He is hidden, but he's not absent. He is forever overseeing and faithful to his purposes for his chosen people. Yes. Secondly, anti-Semitism is a hatred of a people on a scale massively greater than any other people hatred throughout the world. Its focus and scale are the very statement that God exists. It's a spiritual phenomenon motivated by a satanic enemy determined to frustrate God's purposes which he knows that he can only complete them by destroying the Jewish people. Number three, up to the present century, persecution of Jewish people has been released then within certain countries, mostly in Eastern Europe, you have Germany, Poland, the pogroms in Russia then. Elsewhere, even in the Middle East then, the exiled Jews were integrated parts of multi-ethnic communities then, and persecution was localized. In our own country, they were generally welcomed and respected for their business acumen. Nevertheless, I remember being taken back at school when a friend of mine blurted out they were horrible people. You see, I couldn't understand this. This was my first taste, really, of something that I now realize is an endemic spiritual virus. They're no better or worse than you or me, these people. You know, this is, this is a spiritual virus that infects people to hate them. And today is a clear signature that we are right at the end of the times of the Gentiles Anti-Semitism has gone global. Everywhere, even in countries we formerly respected as highly civilized, this hatred is being demonstrated on the streets on a massive scale, and Jewish people are living in fear within societies which have lost their integrity, and the forces of law and order are now being carried out then to counter it. The fourth point I think to make here is that God did not stop the Holocaust of his people in AD 70 and AD 134 and 34 following their national rejection of him. But during later persecutions such as the Inquisition and the pogroms, much of Jewry had the option then of fleeing elsewhere. The Jews could move off then like in the pogroms of course sent a lot of Jews over to, over to America then. But, but God of course did not stop the Nazi Holocaust when one third of the Jews on earth were murdered then. But in the tribulation, Zechariah 13 tells us that two-thirds of the people will be destroyed when the world comes against Israel. But the remaining third, they will be refined and they will be purified in the fire. And then, as Paul tells us in Romans 13, all Israel will be saved. And lastly, I want to make the point really that the story of Esther is a prophecy of the end of the tribulation, where the Jews then are now n not only delivered, but they're also able to execute judgment on their enemies. In Deuteronomy 28, they are promised that they will then be the head and no longer the tail, and every nation that will not honor them will be destroyed. Let's pray, shall we? Oh dear Lord, we thank you then for the lessons that we have learned through this book of Esther. They say that five six of your word concerns your chosen people. They've given us your word. Your Jewish apostles started our churches, your ecclesia, the called out ones. They laid out the prophetic future before us, and they gave us hope for that future. 
Paul, that Jew that you had to transform, brought us so much of the foundational doctrine to guide us into fruitful, holy lives. And above all, the Jewish people gave us that incomparable gift, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who would take upon himself the burden of our sinful natures, and through grace, that totally undeserved favour, would redeem us to be co-heirs with him in glory. We recognise that the malaise of so much of your church is because it ignores or dismisses Israel, or even has the temerity to think it has replaced Israel. Help us, Lord, we pray, to be ever mindful of your continuous importance to you, of your people Israel, and provide them with the necessary support that they need in these dangerous and difficult times. We pray this in our Saviour's name. Amen.